the world that we're living in, I'm not, I'm not telling you guys anything new. It's just, it's just weird, isn't it? Beck, if you, there you go. I see your beautiful faces. It's just weird. Would you agree? And it's, I, it's just this feeling that I have that, like, with election coming and with when would this virus end and, and all these questions that are heavily on our heart, I put a poll out and I asked, hey, what do you think about the virus? Is it in the front of your mind, back of the mind, or are you not even thinking? And most of you guys say it kind of wobbles between the front of your mind and the back of our mind. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that I don't have the answers, but Jesus does. I don't have the answers, and if you come to me for advice, I'm going to give you advice that's going to be found in God's Word. But I think sometimes we forget about childhood songs that brings us so much joy to our heart. We as adults have sometimes complicated what what God, Jesus, has made extremely simple. So... I want to encourage you from the very beginning with a song. And now you are going to make a fool of yourself, as I will as well. Because here's the deal. Scripture talks about that we need to have childlike faith. And what you read throughout the entire Bible and even Revelation, it's, it's really actually simple, even though it seems complex. Even though the complexity means I don't know what's going on, we can rest assured in one thing. That God is in control. So, we're going to sing a song. This is the first part of the song, and it says this. My God is so what? Okay, all right. My God is so big, so what? And so, there's nothing my God cannot do. Everybody clap, clap. Okay, so here are the motions. We're going to make full of ourselves. Our God is so big... All right, if you're not doing this, by the way, if you're at home and you're not doing this, Jesus knows, okay? All right, so here you go. I I can see you. So our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. You see my biceps? They're just talking about God's biceps here. There's nothing my God cannot do. Okay, let's go to the next one. So we'll repeat that again. So this this is the next one. The mountains are his. The rivers are his. The stars are his handiwork, too. And they'll repeat it, okay? All right, so I did this without singing because I want you to drown out my voice, all right? So we'll go back to the very beginning, and we're all going to do this together because I, would you agree? I mean, just listening to this, it's like, kind of gives you like peace for all the way from the very beginning, right? I don't know about you. I mean, as a child, it's like, yes, God is so magnificent. I was, I was afraid of somebody hiding underneath my bed, and I'd always sing this song kind of before I went to bed. So here we go. Ready? Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Here we go. The mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. All right, you guys, it's great, absolutely. Now, now here's the deal. That was the very beginning. Now you're going to sing it as if you actually mean it, okay? Which uh, it's because here's the deal. How many of you guys have some struggles that are going on that you need the truth of this simple song to just resonate over you? How many guys are just going through some stuff? All right, so sing it with authority because everything you just read here and sung here is you can find it all throughout God's Word, and we're, all, we're going to talk about it in depth today in just two verses, just two verses. So here's the deal. Whatever you're going through, sing this simple elementary song with everything inside you as if you actually what? Mean it. And you need it. You with me on this? All right, so don't worry about everybody else. Everybody else is making a fool of themselves. But this time we're all going to stand. We're all going to stand because you're going to be able to move and to sway as an adult. Here we go. If you're here, if you're online, make sure you're doing this too. You don't have to stand up um, unless you don't want to. Here you go. Loud people, you good with me? All right, louder than the baby. Here we go. You ready? Here we go. My God is so big, so strong, and so. 
Louder. Mike. The mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Louder. 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 Lord, may the simple elementary child song resonate in our soul in the middle of our issues, our fears, and anxiety, and as we enter a new dimension, may we be able to see and know that these are true, that you are mighty, you are strong, there's nothing you cannot do. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? All right, here we go. Turn to Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4. I'm going to read, I was talking to Greg, by the way, thank you Greg for preaching last week, very encouraging, thank you very, very much on that. Um, yes, absolutely. You'll, you're here, you'll hear more for Greg, by the way. Um, just give you a heads up. That was actually part one of two parts. So you're going to be able to hear the second part hopefully soon. So Revelation chapter four, I was talking to Greg. I'm like, man, we're now entering after the seven letters. We're entering into what people would call the good stuff, the, the stuff, the, the miracles, the weird things, the signs, the wonders, and all this stuff, um, tribulation. We're, we're going to talk about this. And I was telling Greg just um, throughout this week, I'm like, man, I'm studying hard on this. And I literally, this week, I could not get past two verses, two verses, so we're going to look through Revelation chapter 4, and it'll, it's probably going to take us at least three weeks to get through, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll understand why, all right? So we're going to look at Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and what? 2. All right, here we go. Let me read it, and it simply says this, Revelation chapter, um, and I'm then we're going to dissect this. So by the way, if you don't have a notepad or paper, make sure you take out your cell phones and take pictures of the screen because I'm telling you what, I'm, we're going to really dive deep into this because this is vitally important for the whole book of Revelation. And it says this, after this, I looked and behold a what? All right, everybody got your phones out, um, Bibles out. Okay, here we go. After this, I looked and behold a what? Door standing what? In where? Heaven. Okay, door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up where? Here. And I will show you what, what's the next word? Must take place after this. And then at once I was caught up in the spirit and behold a what? A what? A what? Everybody say throne. Power on the throne stood in where? With one seated on the throne. Oh, isn't that just awesome? Uh, that's just, that's just, I mean, I don't know. That just gives me goosebumps and I'm ready to go because that is extremely important. In order for us to know the entire book of Revelation, in, in, in order for us to know everything that's going to happen, everything that was happening, everything in this prophecy, you have to understand these two verses. Everything else comes out of these two verses. So you want to know about the seals. You want to know about the Antichrist. You want to know about the, the, the 666. You want to know all that stuff. you got to know these two verses. So I'm going to go ahead and break this down for you. And then here we go. It says this. First two words, after this, after what? After this, good, you can read, okay. But what does this mean? This means after the first announcement from King Jesus was made, and he says, John, the author of this, go write down this stuff and send out letters to the how many churches? Seven churches. And we talked about that over the length of eight to nine weeks Ladies and gentlemen, after this, after these letters were written, after all this knowledge was shared, after the announcement of what the good and the bad and the ugly and the consequences of these churches not doing what they're called to do, after this moment, something happened that was just amazing. Because the first part is, is more of a dream, vision type of thing, and it was kind of like an announcement, write these things down and send it, and then after this, 
after he wrote the last period, after he wrote the last word, after he wrote the last sentence of the letters, something magnificent happened. And this is what happened. He was caught up in the spirit and went to the throne room of God. He went to the throne room of God. And if that doesn't give you goosebumps, then you need to be shooken up, woken up, and had a cold glass of water poured all over you. Because imagine this, this human being that was in love with Jesus, hung out with Jesus, and Jesus loved this person. All of a sudden, this moment happens where he's taken up into heaven. And then it says this, after this, I looked and behold a what? Door standing what in heaven? Open in heaven. We talked about this. I had a big door up here and say, now the door is open. How is the door open? Remember, how is the door able to be opened? Jesus. Jesus was the one who came and died for the forgiveness of our sins and accessed the key of death in Hades and was able to unlock the door that nobody else could unlock. Throughout all the histories, everything that's ever happened, he unlocked the door and the door is standing open so that you and I, the world, all who would believe in him, could actually enter the throne room of God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's just phenomenal. Okay, God, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all that, we're going to be talking about his characteristics here in a second. Ladies and gentlemen, he does not, he does not need you. He does not need me. He does not even need this earth because he is. Period, the end. So if you think you're doing God a favor for existing, you're not. But he allows you and me, feeble human beings, to be able to access his holiness, access his throne room, access his heaven that you and I do not deserve to access. Can I get an amen on that? Ladies and gentlemen, this is vitally important. After he wrote the letters, John says, and I looked and standing open in where? In heaven. This is something that we need to understand when it talks about scripture. There's actually three heavens. There's three heavens. Now, don't think I'm a heretic or anything. This is what Scripture talks about. The first heaven is the immediate atmosphere that is over us. And I'll show you a picture in a second. The immediate atmosphere. Because don't we, as a, man, the, star, the, the, the clouds are good. And so on. So all, well, throughout the Scripture, it talks about, and he looked into the heavens. He talked about the atmosphere above us. And then the second heaven is the outer space, the sun, moon, stars, and so on and so forth. And I still love the five-word um, the five words in Genesis uh, is simply this. He made the stars also. For the creation of the stars. I, I mean, I went out cabining. Anybody know what cabining is? You go camping, but you stay in a cabin. That's what I just did for the last three days. So I went cabining. My son, he loves astronomy. He loves going out and seeing the stars. And he called me out. And he's like, hey, Dad, there is outer space. There is the galaxy he didn't say far, far away, but there's the galaxy. He's like, look. And I just stood there, and I'm like, I kind of had to, you know, have you ever been camping, and you have to blind out the, the, the light coming in? You kind of just focus. And when I focus, it's just like, oh, 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 because the stars kept on showing up more and more and more and more and more. And all of those stars, ladies and gentlemen, were created by God And he chose, I mean, he created these massive balls of suns, and he made that just to show off his glory. He didn't have to, but he did. And that's what's called the second heaven. And then the third heaven is what we would call heaven, as we know. So kind of like this. You have the first heaven, which would be our atmosphere, as Scripture talks about. The second heaven would be the stars. And then in 2 Corinthians, um, Paul talks about this third heaven. He was taken up to the third heaven, which in Jewish culture meant where God resides. Even though we're about to find out that God resides everywhere, that is where, figuratively speaking, God's throne room is, and literally all at the same time. So 
this is not one of these. He was caught up into space. He was caught up into the clouds. No, he was caught up in the spirit into heaven. And there was a door. And I'm going to pause and just, just I want you, I'm, I might make you guys weirded out for a second, but my mind is just weird. Are you with me on that? All right. We all see in how many dimensions? Three dimensions. I mean, look at Alan and his gray hair is back here, and it's all three-dimensional type of face, all right? So we all see in three dimensions. Now, I'm not a scientist, but there's probably more dimensions that we, we cannot see. But what I'm going to call heaven and the spiritual realm is the fourth dimension, okay? We cannot see this dimension. For example, do you believe with everything inside of you that there are demons and angels in this room right now? Do you believe that? I believe that 100%. How many guys, again, believe that there's demons and angels literally in this room right now? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Good, good, good. That's good theology right there, all right? The truth of the matter is you cannot see them, but you just know that they're there. We see in three dimensions, even though that there's a dimension that we cannot see. Heaven is, I believe, sort of the same thing. It's the spiritual realm that we cannot see but is coming slowly but surely. We talked about that in a video that we showed a couple weeks ago, how heaven and earth is going to collide into this heavenly place. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that this is extremely important for us to know that here John, he is immediately taken in the spirit to this dimension that he could not see. Where is it? All we know is scripture says it's up. Does that mean it's up through outer space, and many, many light years away, I seriously doubt it. I believe that the stars and the moon and everything is just a third dimension that we can see, but somewhere up is heaven. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's a dimension that we cannot see, but in this case, he saw it. And throughout the book of Revelation, ladies and gentlemen, there are going to be some words some things that are mentioned that, that John is trying his dead level best to try to, he's going to try to articulate. He's going to take these heavenly fourth dimension, this dimension that he's never seen before, items, objects, things, people, objects, and he's going to be like, it sort of looked like this. And God's like, that's a good description of it, but... Maybe not, because he's trying to relate to us. Ladies and gentlemen, this dimension that John is caught up into is the place that we should long for. It's the place that we long to be, even though we cannot see it. So hear me clearly. you got to take your eyes off of the third dimensions. You have to take your eyes off of this world and cast your eyes your heart on what you cannot see, and have, but have faith that it exists. Because when you do, you'll recognize that God is much bigger, more powerful than anything else that we can even imagine. And when we do this, this world, the things that we see and experience, will just be like, eh, that stinks. But I cannot wait to the third heaven. I cannot wait to heaven. I mean, just think about this. Would you agree that every step away from this earth seems to be even more grandiose? I mean, I don't know about you, but I love looking, driving, um, going to New Harmony sometimes and just driving along the wheat field, corn fields, whatever those thingies are that are going up. I just love, and I look, love looking out into the sky. It's just fascinating. And then just like the other night, camping, I went and I saw the outer space. And then when I read the Bible and I understand God's word and the Holy Spirit's like, but there's something greater. There's something so much greater. The further away we get from the earth, further away we get from our earthly troubles, further away we get from this material world and we keep our eyes focused, we will become more and more and more enamored in love and in awe and humbled by God Almighty. And should drop us to our knees every time. Let's continue. In heaven, verse 4, verse 1, it says this, 
after this, I, John, looked, and behold, a door standing open in where? In heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said. Okay, pause. Who is that that is speaking? Not John. The first voice. Who's the voice? Who's that voice? Jesus. Okay, so let's go back to, so we can get a little bit of a refresher. Go to Revelation chapter, go to Revelation chapter 1, um, verses 10 through 18. I want you to get, and this is what, all these, all these words, for those guys who are online that you cannot see it, but we've got about 22, I think, names of Jesus Christ. Jesus is all these. And I'm just going to read some verses so that we can remember who is speaking. This is not some schmuck pastor that is speaking these things out about God. No, this is God's son who came and died for the forgiveness of your sins and my sins. He is the authority. He is the power. He is the king of all kings. You with me on that? He is the Lord of all what? So when he's speaking, it's not just the schmuck in heaven or this angel in heaven. No, this is the king of kings. This is the Lord of lords. So we need to shut up and we need to listen. You with me? Here we go. Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 10. And this is what he says. It says, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a what? Trumpet. So he's referring back to, this is loud, this is an announcement, and you'll hear about trumpets later on. But this is the announcement uh, that the king is, is, is speaking. He's saying, write what you see. Okay, so basically write it to the churches. And then verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands stood one like the Son of Man, clothed in a long robe, gold with a golden sash around his chest. His hair, uh, his, his hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a fire, a flaming fire. His feet were bronze and bronze, refined by the furnace. And this voice um, was like a roar of many waters. And in his right hand held seven stars. And his mouth came a sharp to a double-edged sword. And his face shone like the sun, shining full of strength. Listen, listen. Listen, verse 17, this is the American human issue. This is your problem, Christians. You see the working of Jesus. You know about his grace. You read about who he is, and he's try- John is trying to articulate who he is, who this trumpet voice is, and John didn't be like, ooh, that's pretty cool. No, when I saw him, I fell at his feet, the What? That's the problem. We are standing. I was over here, no, no offense, but I'm standing over here, and we're singing about Jesus. We're proclaiming Jesus. And some of you are like, oh. yep, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Every time we say the name Jesus or proclaim his truth, it should cause us to fall prostrate on our face. John, listen, John, the apostle that Jesus loved, the one who walked with Jesus, the one who saw Jesus crucified and rose again, he did not, we talked about this at the very beginning of the series, he did not say, yep, I, Jesus, you love me, let me take some notes for you. No, he fell to his face. You want to know the problem of the church in the world today? It's that. Guilty as charged, guilty as charged. So as we enter the throne room, and as we talk about the rest of this revelation through however many weeks, years it's going to take us to do, hear me clearly. You have to know Jesus is full of authority, and he occupies the throne he represents his father. Continue. He fell down at Jesus' feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, his powerful right hand. And he says, fear what? 
not. I am the first. I am the last. I am the living one. I did die, but behold, I am alive for how long? Forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. So in the middle of our awe for God, which we should, which we sing, we should be surrendering and raising our hands. I know some of you guys maybe were raised Baptist, and you, this is your Tyrannosaurus Rex type of thing in your worship. That's cool and everything, but at least go from Tyrannosaurus Rex to maybe right here, like you had a growth spurt or something like that. All right, because when you do, I mean, listen, you're surrendering yourself. You, it's if you, I don't care if you come and you're singing or praising, your heart is coming, you recognize the goodness of the Father that you don't deserve to have this open door access to you, it should cause you to drop to your knees with bawling eyes out and just saying, I am not worthy to even say the name of Jesus. We'll talk about that in a second. Let me continue. So you, you now know who the voice is. The voice is who? Jesus, which dropped John to his knees, and Jesus himself said, chillax, I got this. You don't have to fear me. You have to respect me. You don't have to fear me, because I'm the beginning and the end. I am in control of it all. He is saying he is sovereign. And then it goes back to um, Revelation chapter 4, and then it says this. Go back to Revelation chapter 4, in verse 1. Now we're about to enter verse 2. The first voice that I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, who is it again? Jesus. He said this, come up here. I will show you what must take place after this, after what, after these seven churches, after these things, after, after you wrote the letters. Listen, did you see what Jesus said? And this is so important. It didn't say, hey, would you mind coming up here? Did he say that? Did he say that? He said, not one of these passive ways, come up here. Now, this is a trumpet sound. He's like, come here. Come. Come. I'm going to show you something great. Come. This resounding, heavenly, powerful voice of the King of kings and Lord of lords. He says, come up here. And then it says, I will show you. You don't have a choice. You are going to come up here and I will, not I might, I will show you what will happen. Do you see the God's sovereignty there? He's like, I'm in control. You don't have the option. I'm going to catch you up and you're going to come to the third heaven. And by the way, I will show you what must, it's going to take place because he's already preordained it. I'm just going to pause for a quick second and saying, ladies and gentlemen, he already knows who's going to get elected. He already knows this virus is going to last forever. He already knows, he already knows, he already knows, he already knows, he already knows. So stop focusing on the earthly and start worrying and concentrating on the heavenly. Ladies and gentlemen, that will change everything. He says clearly, the sovereignty of Jesus with a resounding voice says, you come, John, you don't have an option. I will show you, you don't have an option. What must take place, I'm gifting you with the answers to the future. Isn't that just a good God? Just a really good God that we don't have an option But he does, and he chooses to allow us to be a part of us. And then, verse 2, so after all that, he saw this, and then he went. And at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, notice he went to another dimension. I don't know how to explain it, but he just went to a different dimension. In the Spirit, and it says this, and behold a what? Throne. And behold, a throne. When the early church, when the people, Jewish custom, even the Romans would see the word throne, they would immediately, immediately, immediately go to power, authority, lordship. He's somebody has to, somebody is in control. The question is, is somebody on the throne? And he fills in the blank with that. And he's like, there's a throne in where? In heaven with 
one seated on the throne. Can I get an amen that the heavenly throne of heaven is occupied? He's it's occupied. It's not one of these, oh, God's disappeared from his throne. God's disappeared from his authority. God's disappeared. Here's the deal. He's never left. He's never left his throne. He's always been in control. And I want you to write down these couple things. God has all authority and is not bound by your wishes. So we must submit to his what? Authority. God has all authority and is not bound by your wishes. Here you go. You ready for this? You can pray all you want to that this virus stops and continue to pray. But God does not have to listen to you. He does not have to listen to you. He does not have to listen to me. Because who's on the throne? God's on the throne. And if you are like, oh, but what about the presidency? Listen, it doesn't matter if you pray in Biden. It doesn't matter if you pray in Trump. Guess what? God already knows and he has a plan. So chill. Relax. Stop posting stuff on Facebook that you are ignorant of. Continue to pray. But be submissive under his leadership. I'm just quick. I've got 13 minutes left. It's, not going, to, it's going to last a lot longer than that. Okay, here, listen. Listen to me. I am nervous for some of you in this room. That if your party is not elected, you'll go into depression, anxiety, and anger. If your party is not elected in this next official election, however long it's going to take, you'll be depressed, you'll be anxiety, anxious, and you will be angry. Shame on you. Shame on you. Because if that's the case, then guess who is on the? Here's the throne. This chair represents the throne room of heaven. I know it's not very cool looking, but it's the only thing that I can find. Okay. Is Trump on the throne? Is Biden on the throne? Or are you on the throne? Or is God? Then why on earth are we worried about an election? Go vote. I'm not saying don't vote. Why are we worried about if another left or right up and down wins? Let, enough politics talk. Who's on the throne? Has he ever left? The throne is occupied and has never stopped being occupied. Let's talk about the throne for a quick second. Oh, actually, one more point. So God has all authority. He does not have to abide by your wishes because he has all authority. Number two is God did not have to show us what has to take place, what must take place. He wanted to because he has all authority. The book of Revelation didn't even have to be written. Isn't that just pretty cool? The book of Revelation didn't even have to be written. You don't and I don't deserve to have the book of Revelation. We know what's going to happen. We know that Jesus wins. Can I get an amen? amen? He wins. God's on the throne. And if you are a believer of him, you'll be together with him forever. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the perspective that we need to keep. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he did not have to give us the book of Revelation. He wanted to. Why? Because he's good. Very, very good. All right, let's continue. All right, Revelation, and then it continues. Revelation chapter 4, we talked about this throne. This throne is what? This throne is what? Occupied. This throne is what? Occupied. occupied. You got to give this. The throne is occupied. From, in order for us to understand the rest of the book of Revelation, you have to understand the throne room. You have to understand the throne room. Every time, throne room, throne room, throne room. In fact, about 40, 46 times, the throne and the occupying of the throne was mentioned in the book of Revelation. I guess it's important. Okay? If it's mentioned 46 times in actually Jewish culture, if it was repeated even two times or three times, it means pay attention. But 46 times, it means it's important. But that's the problem. We as Americans, we have other thrones, other people that we put on the throne. And that's called idolatry. And God is not happy with idolatry. Let's continue. Write this down. No matter what happens on the earth, 
God is still on and has never left his throne and is actively, can I say an amen for actively? Is actively in control of what? Everything. Everything we're going to talk about. God is sovereign. We're about to talk about what sovereignty is in a second. Well, what is sovereignty? God is sovereignty, sovereign overall. What is sovereignty? I wish this could be like seriously a six-week series on just God's sovereignty, just within inside of itself. But here's a cliff note. He's superior. He's great. He's supreme in all authority. Ruler, independent of others. Our God is so big, so strong, and so what? Mighty. Mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. The mountains are his. The rivers are his. The brilliant stars are his handiwork too. Ladies and gentlemen, God is in control. I love what it says in Isaiah 66, 1 through 2. It says, this is what the Lord says. Heaven is my what? Throne. That's where he is. Heaven is my throne and the earth is his what? Footstool. I know about you, but a footstool, have you, I mean, I know you like my feet, right? You love my feet? I mean, you, if you say you like my feet, um, you have not been very close to my feet. All right. Um, let's just say this stage, we vacuum and we clean as much as possible. But literally, let me show you my feet. It's dirty. You see my dirt? You see all that dirt? That's just dirt. That's just, that is for like 15, 20 minutes yelling and screaming on the stage and walking around. This is dirt. And what does he say? It's like the earth. That's just where I put my dirty feet. And we edify and lift up this earth. And he's like, why are you worrying about my footstool? Why are you worrying about this when in fact I'm sovereign even over the footstool? So focus in on who is in the throne room, occupied throne. <laughs> and if we keep this in the forefront of our mind, church, if we keep, it changes everything. And as Jesus says in Revelation chapter one, fear not. I'm the alpha, I'm the omega. I have everything underneath my authority. So with that being said, let's take these notes really quickly. And this is just a cliff notes about God's sovereignty. Pay very close attention. This is a doctrinal teaching right here, which means these are some truths that you must understand about God's sovereignty. Sovereignty means God is in what? Control over everything. Here we go. Write this down. God is in control, sovereign over all things. And before all things, he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the what? He is, what's the next word? He is immortal. He's immortal, and he is present where? Everywhere. So that, why? So that everyone can know him. Revelation chapter 21, it says this, and we'll talk about this later on. It says, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the one I, the, to the thirsty I give from the spring of water as payment. Okay, so I'm forty. Three years old, okay? I'm 43 years old. I feel really, 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 really old. And I look at some of you, and I'm like, man, you're really, really, really old. Okay, let's just say, let's just say we're all 80 years old in this room, okay? 80, 80 years. Would that be just like depressing? Unless you're 80 in the room. Okay, okay. All right, anybody 80 in the room? 80 plus? Good, I chose a high number. Yeah, okay, all right. So imagine we're all 80. How wise we'd be and how knowledgeable that we'd be. Wouldn't that just be awesome to be 80 years old? The answer is yes, because we're almost dead and we're going to see Jesus. But all the 80 years of knowledge and life that we've lived. Listen, God has sovereign and he's been here since the, what? Beginning. So if you're an early earth person, maybe you think that the earth is about five to 6,000 years. Maybe you're one of these people that, um, I forgot what they're called, whatever, that billions of years old. Okay, I don't believe that, but it's up to you. All right, but here's the deal. Even if a billion years or 6,000 years, that's longer than 80 years. God knows and has been here forever. So he's seen pandemics before. 
He's seen political rises. He's seen political falls. He's seen all of this. He's seen your depression. He's seen death. He's seen it all. And he's like, I'm in still in control. Nothing has made me stop, a what, stop being on the throne. Why? Because he is sovereign and he is in control. But this is the problem, ladies and gentlemen. This is the problem. We within are the flesh and the spirit. We always talk about this. We are battling with each other. We're battling for who is in authority. We're battling for who is in authority. This is what we do. We edify our spouse and say, oh, spouse, tell us what to do. Oh, America, tell us what to do. Oh, political parties, tell us what to do. Oh, job, tell us what to do. Oh, my conscience, tell me what to do. Oh, social media, which is always right, tell me what to do. Oh, news, Fox and news and CNN and ABC, Elemental P, you're always right. Ladies and gentlemen, when at any time we allow, I'm not, I'm, I'm not even, <laughs> it's a prop, and I'm, I'm already afraid to even sit on this. But seriously, <laughs> you laugh, I seriously am. I'm not going to sit on this, all right, until the series is done. But listen, this throne room exists for God, not for your spouse, not for your kids, not for anything else. Anything else that we put in the place as authority over our life other than God, it's idolatry, and God hates idolatry, hates it. And you wonder why America is, is going the way it is and the world is going? It's because there's idolatry. I'm just going to leave it at that. We'll talk about that another day. Number two, God is in control over all things, over all things. And he holds all things together, both in heaven and on earth, both visible and what? Invisible. Colossians 1, 16 through 17, it says, For by him all things were what? Created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, whether dominions or rulers or authorities, over all things were created through him and what? For him. It's for his purpose and for his glory. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So I'm just going to just, all right. Sometimes we think that God has left his throne or left, he's not active. First off, that's not true. But ladies and gentlemen, when we feel, notice, it's a feeling. When we allow our feelings and our emotions to clog and to mess with um, who's on the throne, we forget that if God chose to simply remove his authority and a remove his holding together of this earth, everything would just fall apart. Just imagine, just he holds everything what? Together. Imagine, if he chose to just say, mic drop, I'm done. Literally, literally, all the planets, the earth, oxygen, the stars and everything would just start falling. Think about this. If he's holding it all together, you've heard the stories. If we're any closer to the sun, we'd burn up. If we were either, either any further away from the sun, we would what? Freeze. But God's like, I got you. Right around, oh, it's getting cold. It's getting, I got you. It's getting hot. It's hot. Now it's cold. You with me on that? He holds it all together. So think about this. Your life, how your life might be falling apart right now, imagine how your life would be without God. That's where my heart goes for you. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, I don't want to be you. I'd rather be persecuted and my throat cut and die for the sake of Jesus Christ than to not have God. So hear me clearly. If you don't know Jesus, I beg you to live as Christ and to die is so much gain. Please put your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. Revelation, or Romans chapter 11, 33. Oh, I didn't get to, okay, this point. God is in control, which is, means he's what? Sovereign, okay, let's come back to me, here we go. God is in control, he's what? Sovereign, God's in control, stick with me, he's what? Because he knows all things, past, present, and what? Future, and isn't it pretty cool that we get to see some future stuff in Revelation, we'll get to that later on. There is no limit to his knowledge, for God knows everything, what? Completely. Before it even happens. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. 
<laughs> so I just, it's just like, it's like, why do we, why do we put other things there that are more knowledgeable than God? It just doesn't make sense. Oh, the depth and the riches of the wisdom of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.25, it says this. The foolishness of God, he's making an illustration, as God's not foolish, but in the sake of the argument, for the foolishness of God is wiser than any human, uh, any man. The weakness of God is stronger than any man. And if we lack wisdom, James chapter 1, verse 5, let him ask God who gives generously without reproach. Ladies and gentlemen, why do we ask Facebook? Why do we ask Wikipedia? Why do you even ask your pastor when you can ask God? Last one, I believe. Hopefully, yep, last one is this. God is in control, a.k.a. he's what? Sovereign. Because he can do all things and accomplish all things, nothing is too difficult for him. He orchestrates. He what? He what? Orchestrates. He allows, orchestrates, and determines everything that is going to happen in life. Whatever he wants to do in the universe, he does. For nothing is impossible with him. I'm going to pause. Because many of you guys might be thinking, but what about our free will? What about, what about this? The answer is yes. And I use this illustration sometimes. It's simply this. If this is this microphone, let's just say this microphone here. Can you see the microphone? All right. I have the choice to pick up this microphone anytime I want to, right? I have a choice, Right? I could pick it up whenever I want to, right? Right? Who said no? Okay. The answer is no. But yes, I can choose to pick up this microphone anytime I want to unless it goes against the will of God. So if in God's sovereignty, his knowledge, his holding everything together, there's nothing is impossible with him. If this microphone, with, if me picking up this microphone would hinder Stephanie from coming to know Jesus, and Jesus has a plan for Stephanie to come to know him, and if me picking up this microphone would hinder Stephanie from coming to know Jesus because that is God's plan and God's will, will I be able to pick up that microphone? No. Because God is sovereign. He has a plan but we also have a choice unless it goes against God's sovereignty. Isn't that just God's grace, how awesome God is? Okay. Last one is this. Nothing is impossible with him. So you remember the story, the Christmas story of Mary, how this virgin Mary um, had this encounter by an angelic angel. Remember? If not, you're not paying attention here at Christmas. An angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, Mary, guess what, virgin girl? You're going to have a baby. And Mary's like, you know what? How can this be since I am a what? Virgin. So she understand the acts of what it took to have a baby. And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Well, what? Now that's deep right there. We'll get to that in Christmas. Therefore... The child will be born, and he, what? You see God's sovereignty right there? Will be called. In other words, you don't have a choice what the name is. He will be called holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, who was ancient in age, also is conceived um, six months. And then watch this. For nothing will be impossible with God. Can I get an amen? Because he's what? Sovereign. He's in control. And he's like, how can this be? God's in control. This is what I want to leave you with. Listen closely to what Mary understood about God's sovereignty. Not only was she a teenager, she was discipled, and she was a part of a good family, and now she's about to get married, but now she's going to birth the Son of God, Jesus. She didn't be like, um, can you tell me that again? All right, let, let me get this clear. Never had sex. Okay, so, okay, angel, just sit. I'm, I'm just a little confused right now. Just, all right, can you tell me how this is exactly going to work? That's not what she did. 
not once. Other than one time, she submitted. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed her. How are you stealing the glory of God? Who and what are you putting on the throne other than God? When have you stopped serving him? When have you stopped being in awe of him? It is time to repent, be prostrate in our prayers, in our thoughts, and our all. And be like Mary. Let it be so. I'm your servant. Bring yourself glory since you're sovereign. Lord, thank you. Thank you that in the middle of a world that it's just weird. Thank you that you have never left your throne. Thank you that you've known our doubts and you loved us. Thank you that you know the plan that you have for us. And sometimes your plan is discipline. Sometimes our plan is trials that you have for us. But no matter what, may we always know that we are servants and not lords of you, our God, our creator, our sustainer of all. And may we know that we might not know about this election. We might not know about this virus. We might not know about the health issues that we have. We might not know about our finances. We might not know. We might not know. We might not know. But we must know this, that you are in control and you are sovereign over all the intricate details of our life and all you want us to do is have faith that you are in control. Lord, if there's someone in here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, may you prick their heart, lead them to repentance, because Jesus, you came into your creation to die for the forgiveness of our sins so that we can enter through this open door and have a relationship with the Father through the Son who rose from the dead. Lord, forgive us for our doubts, our insecurities. And Lord, I pray that as we close that we will sing a song of your holiness realizing that you are in control. Let's all stand.